Good morning, church family. I hope you are doing well. Thank you, Jim and Kayla, for leading us in worship this morning. I truly appreciate another opportunity to preach the word of the Lord to you today and also for the remainder of this month. Um, As Russell's getting ready for his move to St. Louis, um, I'm going to be filling in for him a little bit here um, in the pulpit. Um, But before we begin today, I'd like to offer up a prayer for False Creek. So if you'll bow your heads with me and we'll pray. God, I love you. And I thank you. Lord, since April 11th, we have been praying for False Creek. God, we have been lifting up False Creek to you every single week. For nine weeks now, God, we have been praying for False Creek, Lord, that you can move in a mighty way. God, the most important thing is that the students that come with us accept you as their personal Lord and Savior. Lord, that's what we want. That's the desire, Lord. That's the reason why we do False Creek. And so the students that come with us leave camp with a knowledge of the saving grace that you offer. And Lord, I thank you that that's even an option. Lord, I I thank you that you uh, died on the cross for us. And Lord, I thank you that we can share that message with others, including students. Lord, I thank you for False Creek, the facility that they have down there, Lord, that we can use that to preach your word, to preach the gospel. Lord, I love you, and I thank you. It's in your name I pray. Amen. I really appreciate all that this church has done for me. I love Harvey Road Baptist Church. You have made me and my wife feel at home, and I truly appreciate that. You have been so supportive of our ministry. Um, And today, I'm able to continue in that ministry by preaching a series. Um, Today, we're going to start the first part of a series in the book of 1 John. So if you'll turn there with me, please. 1 John. John. Pastor Russell challenged me last winter uh, to pick a shorter book of the Bible and read it every single day for a month. Every single day. For a whole month, he said, I want you to pick a short book and read it. And I said, okay, and I picked 1 John. This was the book that I chose. And um, later on, I'm actually going to give that uh, challenge to you as a church, Uh, but we're going to talk about that much later. But let me show you what to expect. If you were to pick a shorter book of the Bible and read it every day for a month, this is what you could expect. The first time you read it, the first time I sat down and read 1 John, I was severely confused. (laughs) Um, I read it, and I had no clue what was going on. Uh, The second time I read it, I kind of got it maybe a little bit, a little more Um, The third time I read it, I got it just a tiny bit more. The fourth time, I said, okay, I see the major themes. I see where the the author's going. I know his purpose. I know kind of the background, right? I kind of get it. The fifth time I read it, I looked at it, and I said, I still have no clue what is going on here. Um, And it does that over and over and over again, and I feel overwhelmed, and then I feel okay about it, and then I feel overwhelmed, and I feel okay about it. I understand it, then I don't, and it's just this continued cycle over the entire month of reading a shorter book like this over a month, and and I love it. And church, that's your challenge, and I'm going to talk about that later, but um, I'm going to challenge you to do that same thing. But 1 John right now, it's my favorite book of the Bible, and as a preacher, if I have the opportunity to preach through a book of the Bible like this, I will always do that for many reasons. The first is that it's really hard to escape the context of this book, right? As as a preacher, I never want to get up here and say something incorrect. I don't want to stand up here and say something that's just simply not true. So I have to stick to the context. And when, when we preach verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book, it's really hard to escape the context. It's not impossible, but it's very hard to say something out of context, right? So that reason alone should be enough for me to preach like this, but there's some more. Another reason is is it forces me to preach through the uncomfortable topics of Scripture. If you've ever read the Bible, you know that there are some topics in here that you kind of want to shy away from. Some topics that you would not want to hear preached from a pulpit like this, right? Some passages that I personally, I would like to ignore or shy away from. But if I preach through a book of the Bible, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, I have to discuss it. I have to. I'm, I'm forced to preach through all of Scripture verse by verse, and, and as a preacher, that can help me, and it helps the whole church body. I mean, we can understand this stuff, and everyone grows in their faith when we force ourselves to look at the difficult passages of Scripture, right? The last reason I have preach uh, book by book, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, is next week, when I, or actually tomorrow, when I sit down to write next week's sermon, I don't have to go, 
funny story, funny story, funny story. I don't have to do that. I don't have to go creative title. What, what's, what's good? What would be, you know, attention getting, right? I don't have to do that. All I have to do is go, okay, we've finished verse four. What's verse five say? I can focus on scripture, right? And that will be the focus on all that I do. And quite honestly, preaching should always have a scripture focus, right? And as long as I'm standing at this pulpit, I want you to hear God's word and not my words. Um, so with all of that being said, we are going to look at first John. We're going to look at the first four verses of the first chapter of John 1. Let's read this. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life which is with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Dear God, I love you, and I thank you, Lord. I thank you for your word. God, again, I said it once, and I'm going to say it again, Lord. Don't let this be my words. Let it be your words. God, let, your word does not return void. So, God, I pray that as we look at these first four verses, Lord, that you would change us as a result of your word. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Something that just revolutionized the way I read the Bible is context. Context is so important. And today, this first sermon is we're going to look at the context of 1 John. Um, and we're going to lay down the foundation of the book, and we're going to break down those first four verses that we just read. That's today's message. And the first thing you'll notice if you look in your Bibles right there, the author of this letter is never mentioned. If you look there, it's, it's not, right? A most New Testament letters, it's a common tradition that they start with the author's name. It's just a common tradition. We got Galatians, Ephesians, Romans, they always start out with the author's name. Like this is Galatians chapter 1. The first word of Galatians is Paul, right? So Paul wrote this book. It's, it's a common tradition for the author's name to be said first, but the author of this letter of, of 1 John doesn't do that, and I know what you're thinking. Then why do we call it 1 John, right? If, if the author is not mentioned, if we don't know who the author is, why do we call it 1 John? This is a good question. I thought that when I was reading in my commentaries, and Early church history has always, always attributed this letter to the Apostle John. Always. All throughout church history, all of our most reliable sources said that the Apostle John wrote this letter. Let me give you a good idea of this. There was a man that lived after Jesus, and his name was Polycarp. Some of you may have heard that name before, Polycarp. He's pretty well known in church history um, after Scripture, and his name's Polycarp. And Polycarp had a disciple, and his disciple said that the Apostle John wrote 1 John. Okay, so that's, that's our source. The Polycarp's disciple said 1 first, first John was written by John. Who's Polycarp? Polycarp is a disciple of John. So we have John, Polycarp, Polycarp's disciple, and he said John wrote this book. That's our most reliable resource on this. Plus, all the word choice, all the themes, the style, everything is so, so similar to the gospel of John. So, we're going to make the assumption, the very safe assumption, like the rest of church history and the person who very well knew John, we're going to make that assumption and say that the Apostle John wrote this book. He is the Apostle John, the one disciple recorded in Scripture as the one whom Jesus loved. This is a very interesting title to have. I don't know about you, but I would strive to have that kind of nickname, Colton, the one whom Jesus loved. Well, we know Peter, right? He was the leader with a temper, right? We know Judas, he was the betrayer. You know Thomas, he was the doubter. But we have John, and he gives himself the nickname, the one whom Jesus loved. And just from that nickname, you can assume that he had a very close and personal relationship to the Savior. Well, what else do we know about John? He actually has another nickname that Jesus gave him in Scripture. Sons of Thunder. Sons of Thunder meaning that he must have had a very fiery temper. And let me tell, let me tell you this little story. There's a, there's a story in the Gospel of Luke where they're going out, all the disciples and Jesus, they're sharing the Gospel, and they try to go into this Samaritan village. And they try to go in, and the Samaritans, they go, we don't want you here. We don't want you here. Go away. Go somewhere else. They get rejected. And Peter, 
I'm sorry, and then John and James, the two brothers, right, the apostle James and the apostle John, they look at Jesus after they get rejected and they say, at your word, we will command fire to come down and burn this village and kill everybody. That's what they wanted. Sons of thunder, right? You can see that. He had a very fiery temper. And John, the apostle John, was originally a disciple of John the Baptist. We see this in, in scripture. But whenever John the Baptist saw Jesus and said, that's the Messiah. This is the one. John left everything to follow after this man. In fact, all of the disciples left everything to follow after Jesus. All of them did, even including their lives. At the writing of this letter, which would, which would have been around 85 to 95 AD, all of the disciples, except for John, of course, would have been dead due to persecution. They gave their lives up for the gospel. And John is writing this letter to believers. And his audience is uh, believers in modern-day Turkey, which Bible times would be Asia Minor. And John here, in the first four verses, he's laying out his credentials. Before he makes his case, he is building his own reliability. So before we get into anything else, this is what he wants his audience to know. He's a first-hand witness to these events of the word of life. He was there. He watched. He touched with his own hands. He heard with his own ears coming from the mouth of Jesus. He is a first-hand witness to Jesus. And this is super important. Why? Context. Why is it important that he lays out his credentials? Context. Let me tell you why. This is the context. The church at this time, his audience here, was, the church was being infiltrated by false teachers. These false teachers were coming in, they're like, yeah, we believe in God, and then they came in and they started teaching all of these things that just weren't true. They were teaching like they knew Jesus, like they were there. They were teaching all these things that just weren't true. In fact, this was a very dangerous heresy that they were teaching. And these people were known as Gnostics. Um, and they entered the church and started teaching Gnosticism. And basically, Gnosticism is this. Everything physical, that table, this pulpit, the stage, that mic stand, the chair you're sitting in, everything physical is sin. This is what Gnostics taught. Everything physical in the flesh is sin. Everything. So, if Jesus was sinless, the Gnostics taught that Jesus was not physical, but he was a spirit. He looked real, he was with them, but he wasn't physically there. He was a spirit. That's what the Gnostics taught. And this was being taught in churches. And this is a major problem. I heard, um, I listened to a couple sermons before I, I wrote this one, and this is the way this preacher explained Gnosticism. He said, if you were walking with Jesus on the beach, you and Jesus, you're walking together, you look behind you, and there's only one set of footprints, because Jesus, although he looked physical, wasn't physical. He looked like he was there, but he couldn't be touched. He had no physical body at all, no flesh, no blood. He couldn't be touched. This is what Gnostics taught. And just from that alone, you can see this is a very dangerous heresy, right? Because how can Jesus represent humanity if he wasn't human? How can he pay for the sins of the world if he can't die? We needed a new Adam to fulfill the law and pay our debts, but if Jesus was not 100% man, if he was not 100% human, he could not do this. He couldn't represent humans. Why? Because he wasn't human. He was a spirit, right? So at that point, we're left to pay for our sins alone, and salvation becomes impossible. Now we're waiting for the Messiah, right? And we're just going to keep waiting and keep waiting and keep waiting, because these Gnosticisms, they weren't teaching about Jesus. They were teaching about this fake Jesus, and we're going to talk about that later. But this is what was being taught in churches, and this is a huge problem for John. So he writes this letter to combat that heresy. This is being taught in churches, Gnosticism. He's a spirit, and John says, uh-uh. So he writes this letter. 1 John, as a response to that Gnosticism being taught in churches. This is what he says. We're going to read the first four verses again with that context. Now let's look at this. One through four. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which is with the Father and was made made manifest to us. <clears throat> that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Verse 4. 
And we are writing these things to you so that our joy may be complete. John says that he was there. He saw it. He physically saw Jesus. So first thing out of the gate, before anything else, he says he was not a spirit that couldn't be touched. No, he was physical. He was human. He was real. John is, he's calling out this dangerous heresy by saying, I was there. You don't know what you're talking about. I was there. These Gnostics weren't there, but I, I touched him. I spent years of my life with this man. I watched him be hit, spit on, and nailed to a cross. He was a physical human. And you can see why the Apostle John is passionate about this, because these Gnostics' teaching denied everything about Jesus, including the reason he came, which was to die. And remember, John, he's writing this letter to believers, to Christians, to people who believed in physical Jesus. He wants his audience to know the difference between a believer and a deceiver. So he says in chapter 4, verse 2, By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh is from God. John is calling out this heresy of Gnosticism. Do not believe their doctrine. If they teach you that Jesus was not physical, if he did not come into the flesh, don't listen to them. They are not from God. They are from Satan. This is the standard that he uses, that he wants his audience to use, right? Listen for their stance on this. This is the quickest way to see if they are a false teacher or not. And I love 1 John because it's very black and white. He does not leave any gray area. If you've read this letter, you know that. This is a reoccurring theme for John. It's black, white, light, dark, child of God or child of wrath, true teacher, false teacher, death, life, sin, righteousness. There's no gray area. And this is a prominent theme for him. And today, 2021, it is very hard for us to take this in. Why? We love to live in the gray area. We do. Where there should be only one or two options, just two options, we like to think of a third, fourth, fifth. We love to live in the gray area. And John, he's going to call that out. You're either real or you're fake. There's no in-between. And this first phrase that John includes here is, that which was from the beginning. Other translations say, what was from the beginning. Verse 1. Um, and there's actually two passages in Scripture that's similar to this. That which was from the beginning. You could probably guess what they were. Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? And the second similar phrase to what was from the beginning is John chapter 1. This is one of those clues why we know he wrote this. This is what John chapter 1 says. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. We're supposed to make the connection here. The word of life that he writes about in 1 John, and then the light of men that he writes about in the Gospel of John, and then Genesis, what Moses writes. We're supposed to make this connection. Jesus, the physical Jesus is the eternal God. We're supposed to make that connection there. Verse 1, let's read that one more time. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. John saw Jesus. And he had to preach about him. He had to. So he can't let these Gnostics teach all this false stuff because John says, I was there, I saw him. There's a a story in the uh, Acts chapter 4 where Peter and John, the two disciples, they're, they're preaching the gospel to anyone who will listen. And they get arrested because of it. And they sit in jail for a day or two, and the authority looks at Peter and looks at John, and they say, you can't say Jesus anymore. We don't want to hear you preach anymore. We don't want to hear the gospel anymore. We don't want to hear that. In fact, Scripture says that they were annoyed with them because they were preaching about it so, so, so much. And this is what it says. This is their response. Peter and John, this is their response to them. After hearing, you can't preach, you can't say Jesus, you can't share the gospel. This is what they say. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. John saw Jesus. He spent years of his life with the Savior. He watched Jesus give up his life as a sacrificial death for the world. And these Gnostics were teaching that it just didn't happen. He was just a spirit. And John lays out that he touched him. Verse 2. 
The life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which is with the Father and was made manifest to us. Manifest means to be made clear or obvious. John says that I have seen him, and it has been made obvious that he was in the flesh. He was really on earth walking among us. I can attest because I've seen it and studied him for myself. But why? Why is John taking time out of his day to tell us this again? He said it in verse 1, and now he's saying it again in verse 2. It's kind of repetitive, right? Well, let's think about it. Why is he saying this again? He's, I'm sure he's a very busy man, right? Probably sharing the gospel everywhere to anyone who will listen. He's probably a busy man. So why is he taking time out of his day to say it again? It says in verse 2, The life was made manifest, and we have seen it, and testified to it, and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which is with the Father and was made manifest to us. Eternal life was the motivation behind this letter. John wants his audience to experience eternal life. And you can only experience eternal life if you believe in the true physical Jesus. The Jesus that came into the flesh to live a perfect, sinless life and died on the cross. If you don't believe in that Jesus, you don't believe in Jesus. That's what he's saying here. You cannot believe in this fake spirit Jesus and be saved. Why? That's not Jesus. This Gnostic's uh, teaching, it's not real. It's in their head. It's this fake thing from Satan that he made up. I heard a preacher preach on the number one sin in the world. The number one sin in the world. He preached at False Creek one time. It was, a, it was a camp, and it struck me. The number one sin in the world, this is what he said it was, idolatry. Not adultery, idolatry. Idols. John Calvin wrote, the human heart is an idol factory. An idol is anything you worship over Jesus. And John is trying to fight this. He's trying to get them to believe in the true physical Jesus, Jesus, not an idol with the same name. And maybe when we hear about these idols and this fake spirit Jesus and all this stuff, you think, okay, that's awesome, but when are we going to get to the relevant stuff? When are we going to get to the stuff we can apply to our lives and be changed and go out to the world and share the gospel? This is the stuff we can apply. We struggle with idols today. We make up this idol in our head that doesn't judge us, that isn't holy, who's, who's kind of a pushover, and we worship that idol and we name it Jesus. But that's not the physical Jesus. That's not the Jesus that came into the flesh and died for you and me. Jesus, the true physical Jesus, is not a pushover. But we make this idol in our head. Today, we make up an idol named Jesus. We make up this idol that as long as you don't sin too bad, you're good. Or we make up this idol named Jesus that is okay with sin. Or we make up this Jesus that doesn't require surrender. Or he doesn't, he doesn't care if you're a fan, but the follower is kind of the gray area. You can be a fan, but you don't really have to be a follower. I mean, it doesn't really require commitment. We make up this fake Jesus that doesn't require surrender. We make up this fake Jesus that doesn't require a relationship, but requires some sort of head knowledge. I know John 3.16, so I'm good. Right? We make up this fake Jesus that doesn't care what you do or what you say as long as you have a Bible in your house on the shelf collecting dust. Right? We sometimes make an idol named Jesus and worship that over the real Jesus. We take the God of the universe and we look at him and we treat him like a buffet line where we take the goodness and the love and we kind of throw away the holiness and the justice the holiness and all this stuff, we kind of start taking all this stuff out of God and we start worshiping the love and the gentleness and the patience, but that's not God. God is holy. God is just. He's also love. He's also gentle, but he's also holy and just. And if you take some of those attributes of God and start throwing them away, you have an idol. And we create an idol and worship him over the real Jesus, and we name it Jesus. It's a scary thought because it's a lot more common than you'd think. I've been guilty of this. And the scariest part of this is the idol Jesus does not lead to eternal life. This is the primary reason John is writing this letter. So church, pay attention. Do you serve the real physical Jesus or an idol with the same name? Verse 3. That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us 
And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Salvation brings fellowship that is twofold, God and other believers. And we're going to talk about that in much more detail next week, because that's kind of where John looks at it. But it's important to understand that. This is a test of salvation. John lays these out all over this book to see, do I believe in the real one or the fake one? Do I believe in God or an idol? And he gives so many tests of salvation, and this is the first one. Let me say this. God does not want you to wonder or not if you have salvation. God wants you to be sure of your salvation. In fact, this is why John wrote this letter. He says in chapter 5, He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. These things I write to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Use the test of salvation in Scripture. We are supposed to, right? We're supposed to use this book to our benefit, and that's to know if we are saved. It's not God's will that we sit in bed some nights and we go, I just don't know if I'm saved. That's not God's will. God's will is you know that you are saved. This is something that we should be confident of, and maybe that's something you're not confident of. Maybe that's something you stay uh, awake at night and you go, am I saved? I don't know. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16 says this. Let us then, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace in the time of need. We cannot be saved because of our works, but salvation only comes through the true physical Jesus who died on the cross by being nailed to it. Physical. His perfect blood was spilled so I can have the assurance of my salvation in the holy God. Verse 4 of 1 John chapter 1. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. The reason he's writing this, right? Our joy may be complete. Jesus is the only source of our joy, and we can only experience joy if we put our hope and trust in the true physical Jesus who gave himself up as a ransom for many. And today I need you to be sure that you are serving the one and true physical Jesus. Watch out for these fake Jesus idols that we have been serving or we are serving, right? Kayla, how do we know if we have salvation? This is the question of the age. How do we know if we have salvation? Mark chapter 8, verse 34 says this. And calling to the crowd to him with his disciples, Jesus said to them, if anyone would come after me, Let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. True salvation requires surrender to Jesus. Galatians 2.20 says this, We have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I live, but Christ lives in me. Jesus is calling the shots. That's true salvation. Church, we are going to continue in 1 John next week. But as the first week closes, I must ask you the question, before we go any further in the letter, because this is what John does. Who do you worship? Do you worship the true, eternal, physical Jesus or an idol with the same name? Be honest with yourself and ask God, who do I worship? He'll reveal it. Be honest with him and he will reveal it. Or maybe you know for a fact you worship the true Jesus. You know you do. You you accepted Christ when you were a little kid. Maybe you even teach Sunday school. You might help with the offering. But it's, maybe it's been a while since you've felt God or, or prayed or, or read his word. Maybe it's been a while since you've felt that relationship with Jesus. Accept that challenge that I offered earlier, right? Pick a shorter book of the Bible and read it every day for a month. Use this time, church. Accept Christ. If you haven't done that before, accept Christ. But church, maybe you have. Use this time to dedicate maybe a month. And say, God, I'm, I'm going to read your word. So church, that's your invitation. Who do you worship? Or dedicate your life to him. As I begin to pray, ask God to prepare your heart for this time of invitation. Let's pray. God, I love you and I thank you. Lord, your word is its so powerful. God, just four verses in one letter of a 66 book. God, it, it challenges me to the core. 
It's your word. God, it does not return void. So Lord, I pray that as we look at your word and we, we ask ourselves the question, who do I worship? Lord, we can be honest with ourselves and we can be honest with you and say, is it the true physical Jesus who gave himself up as the ransom for many or is it an idol that I've created with the same name? Or maybe, God, we, we know we're saved and it's just been a while since we've dedicated some time to you. Lord, we have been called to be your children, God, not your foster children. Lord, you are the everlasting Father, and God, let us dedicate our lives to you. Lord, I pray that we start this time of invitation, Lord, that you have the church respond. Lord, your word does not return void. Challenge us today. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Will you stand with me?